Hello, uh, Dr. Alan Clifford uh, speaking. Uh, this afternoon uh, I was sitting in the sunshine with uh, my wife and uh, son and daughter-in-law and then the time came for the evening television news. And it was so sad to see what was obviously an over-exuberant kiss by a Spanish sports official. Clearly it was unwelcome by the captain of the Spanish women's team. But the whole discussion and the obsession with the media was over the kiss and its after effects rather than the uh, superb win by the Spanish team. And all this uh, got me thinking about the kiss. Because there's a great deal in the Bible about kisses. And it has a great deal to do with the Christian gospel. For example, there is a wonderful hymn which dates from the Welsh revival of 1904. The hymn starts like this. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. It's a wonderful gospel hymn expressing the wonderful truth of John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the last four lines of this uh, wonderful hymn uh, are as follows. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love and that really does sum up the christian gospel yes there's a great deal about kisses and kissing and it's a very vivid emblem of the love of god coming to an unlovely world, an unlovely human race, and bringing about reconciliation after our sin, our rebellion against God, our unbelief had ruptured the relationship that we have with him. And God who loves us and is not willing that we should perish, he sent his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world. And it was a mission of restoration. So yes, there's a great deal of truth in kisses in the Bible. A kiss then is a symbol of reconciliation. A welcome on both sides. The kiss given by the giver, the kiss received by the recipient. So different from what's been uh, in the news. And it's significant too that um, in the New Testament, in all the various instructions that are given by the apostles to the churches, there are five examples in the New Testament, four from the Apostle Paul, one from the Apostle Peter, where Christians are exhorted to greet one another with a holy kiss, to greet one another with a holy kiss. And of course, such a greeting uh, is commonplace in Middle Eastern cultures. But the emphasis there is on a holy kiss because sin has degraded so much that is good and innocent. Uh, sin has brought about the corruption of lust, the corruption of love into lust. And so kissing can become a symbol of aggressive lust as seems to have been the interpretation of what happened uh, in, in, in Spain. Yes, there's a lot about kissing in the New Testament. And we shouldn't forget that uh, kissing is used as between lovers. In the Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, there is the kisses of the lover's mouth that are referred to. And there in 
perfect innocence and beauty and and love. So yes, there's a great deal, isn't there, about kissing and kisses uh, in the Bible. And what is important is that it's used as a vivid expression of the gospel, of the reconciliation between God and the human race, between the God of love and the loved but unloving human race. And that really is the problem. And we could say that all the, the mess that's created by sin has been illustrated really on the news and it is, and is so often uh, the case. So the call of the gospel is indeed expressed in this kiss. In fact, the second psalm shows the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God being sent into the world and that the authorities of the world in a state of rebellion against God, they must uh, repent of their rebellion. And uh, in Psalm 2 verse 12, we are told, uh, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. And that is again, the kiss of the acceptance of the kiss of divine love to the human race. And that we are exhorted to respond rather than to reject that love. But it must be a true love, the kiss of faith and of repentance and of worship and adoration. Yes, that's how it should be. But also the Bible speaks about the traitor's kiss, doesn't it? You remember how in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Lord Jesus Christ was about to be arrested, uh, Judas Iscariot, the false disciple, uh, he led the soldiers, didn't he, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the sign that was agreed upon, because it was in the dark, the sign that was agreed upon is that, um, well, I'll give him a kiss, and the one whom I kiss, he's the one you must arrest. And when they met, Judas kissed the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the kiss of the traitor. It wasn't a kiss of love at all. And so often that can be a feature not only of false human relationships, but even within the church, even within religion. There's a great deal of religion where there's no real true love of God, no true hatred of sin and love of the Saviour. Uh, and that is a question that comes to us, us all as Christians. The kiss that we would give to the Lord Jesus, is it the kiss of faith and of love and of obedience and submission and service? Or is it just a religious kiss, which is really a, a traitor's kiss, a complete denial of what the symbol itself seems to indicate? So we have to be very, very careful about this. And God in the gospel kisses us with his love. And then some of you will doubtless remember that perhaps the most famous kiss in the New Testament is in the parable of the prodigal son, and after the prodigal has come to the end of himself and he repents and wishes to return to his, to his father, uh, we're told that uh, his father saw him a great way off. And we're told that he had compassion upon him. He ran to him, had compassion upon him, fell upon his neck and kissed him. Yes, that is the God of the Bible, who is not willing that we should perish. He desires to be reconciled to us, that we might find forgiveness of our sins. We might find newness of life. We might find deliverance from death and eternal damnation, uh, entering into the embrace of, of his love. Yeah, that's the most famous kiss, really, in the Bible, in the parable of the prodigal son. And there you'll find it, of course, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 15 and verse 20. And there's very profound truth in that kiss too. I was thinking only recently that when during the day uh, I leave the kitchen, go out to my office and then perhaps come back and I see my wife and uh, I, I give her a kiss. 
and is normally a, a tr triple kiss. One, two, three. You'll notice that there's almost a symbol of the Trinity in that kiss because it's one love but three kisses. And even in the parable of the prodigal son, uh, that's indicated too. The father had compassion on the son and then he fell on his neck and then third he kissed him. Three elements there we might say. It's one love but those three elements surely seem to me to illustrate the truth of the Trinity that God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. So it's a very wonderful thing. It all brings out the the glorious truth of John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now the item in the news has obviously been uh, over the fact that the response to the kiss was not consensual. The kiss was not welcome. The tragedy in terms of the Christian gospel to the human race is this, that we owe it to God to kiss him with faith and repentance and love and surrender. We owe it to him because of the greatness of his undeserved love towards us. And not to love him, not to consent to love him, really leaves us in a state of total damnation. And if we are to live like that and to die like that, we shall indeed perish forever, as indeed John 3.16 is clearly teaching us. So there's a great deal, isn't there, to think about in the kiss. So you, my dear listener, my dear viewer, uh, the important thing is not your opinion about what's been in the news in Spain. The biggest question of all is this, what is your relationship to God like? Have you responded with the kiss of faith, repentance and love to the God who came into the world in the person of his Son and showers his triple kisses upon you in order that you might be forgiven, that you might be saved? There's nothing really more important than this in all the world, in the whole of history, the whole of your life, whatever else uh, is appearing on the news. So I come back then to that wonderful hymn that um, was the hymn of the revival and how the church needs that too at the present time. There's so much deadness in the church, isn't there? So much mere ritual, so much more, so much mere formality. So I end by quoting again the whole hymn, the kiss of God's love to the human race. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise. He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. The wonderful love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it comes to the message of the cross where the, the kiss love, the loving kiss of God to the sinful human race is particularly displayed. On the Mount of Crucifixion, fountains opened deep and wide through the floodgates of god's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love that's the gospel that's a kiss worth getting excited about. That's the kiss that we must respond to. So, dear viewer, dear listener, I urge you, I encourage you to kiss back to the God who kisses you in the love of his dearly beloved Son. May this be your experience and the experience of people all over the world. Amen and Amen. <laughs>